Can you recall from the last lecture that um, Prestes, the uh, hand-picked successor of uh, Luis, had been elected president, but almost immediately uh, there is this uh, balance of payments crisis, debt crisis, collapse of the valorization program and coffee prices, and Vargas uh, took advantage of this situation uh, and in October 30 led a number of revolts. Uh, the government could not halt the rebel forces, and on October 24th, a revolutionary junta was formed. Um, and um, uh, it made uh, Vargas the, the provisional president. By the way, I've um, I left the S off his name. Sorry about that. I'll fix that. Vargas. Yeah, there you go. Um, so he took power uh, by force. Um, and while there were deep-seated political problems that led to this coup, uh, the economic crisis created the conditions that made it viable. Those who previously advocated democracy saw in Vargas a strong, charismatic leader who could make decisions to improve Brazil's economy. Uh, so from 1930 to 1945, uh, and again, uh, from 51 to 54, Vargas ruled Brazil. His political dominance was clear, and many argue that it was his charismatic personality that created the political stability uh, and allowed for necessary change in economic policies. Uh, there were several uh, attempts to overthrow Vargas's regime, uh, one of which led to the creation of the uh, Estado, Estado Novo, or New State. Basically, there's sort of three phases to his, uh, his rule. There's the 30 to 34 phase, where he is the, the provisional government he had set up, uh, the junta, um, when he governed by decree as head of this government. Uh, then there was a constitution written in 1934 uh, which saw him elected uh, president uh, together with a new uh, constituent assembly. Uh, and then in 37, it, which meant his, his um, uh, term would have been over in 38, and in 37 uh, there was a crisis that led him to declare to dissolve Congress and declare a state of siege, and that's when he establishes the Estado Novo. This is from 37 to 45, uh, and, and then he begins to make, he takes dictatorial powers and begins to make real change. For the economy, that change would mean varying degrees of, of government intervention. To address uh, the economic crisis, Vargas implemented a series of policies that both supported the coffee industry while attempting to wean Brazil off its dependence on coffee. Uh, he felt both things were necessary, and this kind of made sense. Honoring his promises uh, during, made during the presidential campaign, uh, he created the National Department of Coffee that was under his control but had considerable flexibility. Effective immediately, a reduction in coffee tree planting was ordered. In 1920, there had been 1.7 billion trees. That figure had since risen to 3 billion causing in part uh, the glut in production. By 1939, the slow reduction meant there were 2.5 billion trees, curtailing production. Uh, in 1931, the government also introduced a program of, of coffee burning, destroying coffee. It's estimated that 60 million bags were burned by 1939. While these were nominally successful, the industry really only recovered with the onset of the Second World War, uh, much like the U.S. economy only really recovered with, with the war. Most importantly, the government tried to diversify the economy. Uh, agricultural incentives were provided by the government that led to significant increases in livestock and cotton production. In the 1920s, cotton was only 2% of exports. In the 1930s, it rose to 18%. While coffee would remain an important part of the economy, history, and culture of Brazil, its dominance was fading fast and, and, and also the reliance on it. Uh, even in Sao Paulo, uh, planters uh, diversified their crops and limited coffee production so they could farm other crops. On, on the other side, sugar production was reduced. Brazilian sugar could no longer compete on the international market, so the government decided to free up the land uh, for more, pr more profitable cash crops. So a diversification of agriculture that was ultimately healthy for Brazil's economy. The Brazilian government um, reduced its imports by 75 percent between 1929 uh, in 1932, uh, while export, and, and in part because they could no longer afford them, but while exports also fell, they did not fall as fast. People did still need to drink coffee, and that left Brazil with a favorable trade balance despite the economic crisis. Additionally, Brazil's agricultural policies kept a large sector of the society employed. With nowhere else to invest surplus capital, Brazilians, especially the coffee barons, who had kind of been the, the oligarchs before all this happened, 
uh, they began to invest in, in industries uh, which produced goods that had been previously imported. The government assisted through providing tax exemptions and long-term loans with low interest rates to encourage uh, new industry. Although most imports were subjected to tariffs of up to 40 percent uh, to, to protect these baby industries growing, uh, exceptions were made for machinery or raw materials that were used to help build new industries. It was a pretty well-run program. Uh, Vargas strongly supported the growth of industry, but it was uh, growing international belligerence in the approaching Second World War that led to the greatest growth spurt of the era. In 1940, the National Steel Commission was established, followed by the National Steel Company, which built Brazil's first large steel plant. Similar corporations were founded for the production of iron, aircraft, uh, and truck engine production, and river valley development, kind of sort of some of the water projects that like that were going on in the United States. These corporations were funded by a mix of public and private investment. Uh, so the government didn't own all these uh, investments, but it, was, it reserved the right to intervene directly in the affairs of these corporations uh, if it was considered to be in the national interest. So Vargas was not a socialist, certainly not a communist. He was once quoted as saying, the Estado Novo, uh, Estado Novo does not recognize the rights of the individual against the collective. Individ individuals do not have rights. They have duties. Rights belong to the collective. So the idea is uh, we're going to, it's this idea of using uh, force, uh, dispensing with democracy to use force to make everybody come together to achieve great national ends. It's economic nationalism. It's not socialism. It sounds a lot more like uh, fascism. Another area of economic development was transportation. Recognizing the increasing importance of air transport due to Brazil's topography, it's a big place, Vargas encouraged commercial aviation. Uh, and by 1939, there were nine Brazilian companies flying routes that covered 43,000 miles, carrying 71,000 passengers, 223 tons of mail, and 490 tons of freight, which accounted for three-quarters of all commercial uh, traffic in South Africa. This nas nascent uh, industry was encouraged by the military, and in 1941, Vargas created the Air Ministry. Railroad expansion also took place at this time, but there were half as many miles of train track uh, as air routes. Instead, Vargas focused on road construction, leading to the construction of 258,390 miles of road by 1939, sort of a Huey Long type approach. Uh, this focus on aircraft building and aviation companies uh, is evident in Brazil today. Brazil is very dominant uh, in these industries today. In addition to a push for industrialization, the government recognized the need to provide more support for and control of labor. Um, Vargas had a, 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 maybe he was not a openly, uh, he was not an openly um, uh, declared fascist, but he clearly had fascist tendencies, and fascists don't like uh, labor movements and communism, and so um, he thought, we've got to get ahead of this. The, the uns unsuccessful attempt by communists to overthrow the government uh, in 1935 is what gave Vargas the opportunity to seize total power um, and declare the Estado Novo, uh, and so he recognized the growing threat labor could play, and so while it was still in the early stages of development, uh, urban industrialization was taking place, and Vargas felt it was best to put, put in place a new labor code that defined industrial relations. He wanted to get ahead of any potential unrest. Um, so a law was passed in 1943 permit, that permitted unions to organize by plant and industry, but not on a statewide or national basis, lest their power become too great. The Department of Labor oversaw union finances and elections and helped create labor leadership in the country. Vargas also instituted a minimum wage and a maximum work week for Brazilian labor. So he was a champion to labor, but in a way that really tied labor to the government. This was not very different than the way that uh, Obregón, Calles, and Cardenas had, had co-opted labor uh, in Mexico. Um, import substitution uh, industrialization, ISI policies, these ideas of inter building internal industry, uh, they proved to be very successful. Uh, between 1924 and 1939, industrial output grew at an average rate of 6%. Uh, that's twice the average grade of growth in the United States. That, that's robust. Uh, in 1941, there were 44,100 industrial plants 
around Brazil uh, that employ, and it, where there had been no industry at almost at all but prior, uh, that employed 944,000 workers, meaning that most work was still done in small-scale factories and plants, um, still often relying on hand labor rather than machinery. These industries successfully provided substitutes for goods previously imported, and they helped diversify the economy. Due to the Second World War, Brazilian goods were also being exported, and a push towards heavy industry was in place. That sounds like a lot of people, almost a million uh, workers in the industrial economy, but Brazil's population in this era was about 40 million. It's about 190 million today. Uh, and this economic growth was, as you might expect, not evenly spread throughout the country. Most of the population was still land-based and dependent upon cash crops for their livelihoods. And unlike their urban brethren, the rural working class uh, was still subjected to harsh living conditions and included low wages and debt peonage, a condition which placed rural laborers um, uh, in debt to the plantation owners, and they worked to pay off their ever-increasing debt rather than for wages. Brazil continued to rely on coffee as a major source of revenue and foreign reserves. Five states employed three-quarters of factory workers and concentrated most of the industrial wealth. Sao Paulo alone had 41 percent of all workers. So um, the wealth and the, and the industry was concentrated in a few places. The interior was largely untouched and untapped. Vargas tried to encourage migration to these areas by offering 50-acre land grants to those willing to populate the West and the Amazon Valley. This idea would lead to, in 1956, the creation of Brasilia, an entirely new capital, moving uh, the capital from Rio de Janeiro to the, the middle of the jungle. And they built this giant new uh, city, which um, was itself an engine uh, of economic growth. And it was beautiful. Uh, it is beautiful. It, it, it's, even though it's a very new city, it is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of the magnificent architecture. Now, in the 1940s, Vargas was known for his policies that improved the lives and working conditions of Brazil's poor, and he had a very definitely a populist streak. But while this increased his popularity in general, it alarmed the upper classes who feared the loss of their own power. His status was further complicated by the Second World War. Initially neutral, Brazil declared war on Germany and Italy in 1942, to the surprise of many who had assumed he was a fascist dictator and a sympathizer of the Axis. His domestic policies uh, included a relaxation of censorship and a curbing of repressive policies, which increased middle class support, but also brought his dictatorship to an end. Um, elections had been postponed until 1945, at which point Vargas was forced to step down um, when uh, Urico Gaspar Dutra, I think his name is, became president. In 51, Vargas uh, once again ran for election and won a second term as president. The post war policies of Dutra had slowed the growth of the Brazilian economy and the conditions of the country had deteriorated. Vargas once again imposed economic nationalism on Brazil, but his import substitution programs were overshadowed by political intrigues and rumors of an impending coup. Uh, and after the assassination attempt uh, on his political adversary, members of the military leadership tried to force him to resign. And in return, he committed suicide. Uh, seeing the writing on the wall, he, he ended his own life. Uh, ending his tenure as the populist leader of Brazil, wrote this very flowery uh, letter that ended with, Serenely I take my first step towards eternity and li leave life to enter history. Um, and so, uh, so ends uh, this largely beloved, partially hated populist dictator of Brazil.